Hi, everyone. I'm Dr. John Diard, and welcome to LifeSpa.com and our podcast today. Today, we have a very special guest, Micah Mortali, who's written a really awesome book. Uh, you can see I've marked it up like crazy, uh, called Rewilding. I've written a lot of articles about forest bathing and how important nature is. And from the Ayurvedic perspective, it's a huge thing. And, and Micah has written an entire book about this. We're going to dive deeply into how to get back to nature, uh, how to rewild yourself. So let me tell you a little bit about Micah. He's a director of the Kripala Schools, one of the largest and most established centers for yoga-based education in the world. I've been, I've been teaching there for 20 years, I don't know, decades it seems. He's an avid outdoorsman, mindful wilderness guide, 500-hour Kripala yoga teacher and popular meditation teacher. Uh, he's been leading groups in the wilderness and retreat settings for 20 years. He, in 2018, founded the Kripala School of Mindful Outdoor Leadership. If you've never been to Kripala, it's in the Berkshires in Massachusetts. It's a phenomenally beautiful yoga retreat center, one of my absolute favorite places to go. Um, Mortali, Mortali has a passion for helping people come home to themselves and to the earth. He's finishing his master's degrees at Goddard College in nature awareness and mindfulness practices. He lives there in the Berkshires with his wife and children. Micah, welcome. Thanks for being here. Thanks for writing this amazing book. Um, <laughs> I think um, people really need to hear this message, right? I mean, this is all about, about, um, about getting back into nature. Um, I, I wrote an article recently about, you know, getting into nature, and I think it was called something like, how much nature do we really need? And there was a study in the University of Exeter in, uh, in England, and they, they evaluated 20,000 people, and they found out to boost mental health, physical health, immune health, they found that you needed 120 minutes of being in nature per week. You could knock that into little sizes and little pieces, um, or you can take it all at once. But that's how much you needed. And I, and I wanted to, you know, start this conversation by by you telling us um, from your perspective, you know, why is it so important that people rewild themselves? Great question. Um, well, it's such an honor to be on the podcast with you, John. Thank you for having me. And I love this question. I think it's so important today because our lives have, um, as a species, our lives have changed really dramatically over the last couple hundred years, and particularly um, a lot since, um, probably since the iPhone was invented back in 2007, um, when you know we started carrying around a computer in our pockets. Um, the average American spends over 90% of their lives indoors, um, according to the EPA, and uh, an average of 11 hours a day on a screen. Wow. And what, uh, when I heard that statistic, I was shocked. I mean, 11 hours a day. Um, and it's to the point now where um, our interaction with screens and, and technological devices is so ubiquitous, it's almost hard to measure you know, how much we're on them. And, you know, it's important because, you know, human beings, like, although we forget it, we're an animal species. Um, you know, we evolved in relationship to, as you well know, uh, our environments, our ecosystems, our relatives in the more than human world um, to the, um, the great elements um, and the earth. And over the, you know, certainly since um, the agricultural revolution and and more so since the industrial revolution, um, the amount of time that we've been spending in our natural habitat has been steadily decreasing. And certainly I think probably since the internet and um, handheld portable touchscreen devices, it's precipitously <laughs> dropped off. And so with that, there's a whole lot of problems I think that we're seeing that people are beginning to experience um, that might not have been anticipated. And so, um, you know, rewilding is um, a word, a way of thinking about ourselves as members of um, the earth community. And I think it's very easy for folks, many, many people these days who've um, found their lives just migrating indoors. It's kind of easy to forget that we're actually uh, totally interwoven into uh, the web of life on this planet is, as Thich Nhat Hanh would say, like we're part of a great interbeing. Um, and 
So rewilding and uh, the book and the school that I, we launched at Kripalu last fall are really about um, beginning to invite modern people, um, inviting them back into a relationship with their lands, um, their relatives out on the land, whether they be plant or animal or elemental, um, and to begin to open a conversation and a relationship back up um, because the earth is, I mean, I really feel like the, the earth is speaking to us today. It always has been. Um, and it's, we need to really pay attention, I think. Um, it's not going to serve us to um, kind of bury ourselves in, um, you know, in the internet or um, in spaces that we fashion for ourselves to isolate ourselves or insulate ourselves from um, what's happening in the world today. Um, and so rewilding is a way to get back into that relationship, but it's also a way to receive so many of the wonderful benefits that bring such nourishment um, when we, uh, when we have s contact through our senses, you know, with, with the earth. Yes. It's, it's, it's I love the word relationship. It, it is exactly that. And, and what you put into the relationship determines what kind of relationship you have. If you have a partner and you just put a bunch of passive aggressiveness or jealousy or anger or whatever into that relationship, it's not going to go well. In the same way, if you allow yourself to step, you know, to, to move aside and let who you truly are out and let yourself be more vulnerable and, and delicate enough to be loving and kindful and giving into that relationship and respectful and have compassion and understanding for who that person is you're in a relationship with, then all of a sudden you have a, you have a, a, a relationship based on truth, based on trust. And this is such an important kind of a thing. And I, and I think that you're, you're, you're so right. I think that we are in relationship with the earth. I mean, I've written a lot of articles lately on, on quantum physics and Ayurveda mm -hmm. and how, you know, we really understand these fields of consciousness, you know, pervade everything. Um, even before the Big Bang, there were intelligent fields, which gets really cosmic. But in those fields are intelligent and they are conscious and our human system can tap into that field of consciousness. Our brain can. We are not necessarily conscious beings. We just have the ability to tap, upload and download from that field of consciousness. But in that same informed, creative field of intelligence is everything we see, touch and taste and smell. And that relationship that we have with the things in the natural world from the Ayurvedic perspective, right? Those are the things that bring us back to that feeling of stillness, that feeling of silence. You and I have talked a lot about in our lunches together way back when, you know, the idea of Donner Veda, which is the Veda of transformation, the Veda of war, which is a big transformation, but it's the Veda of, of, taking transformational action from the truth of you, from that place of deep composure and calm. And we've lost our composure and calm because we're on a screen all day long. And what nature does seems like it actually helps us dip the cloth in that dye of that silence, that stillness. So we can pull back the bow. Donna Asana was the, the Veda uh, uh, science, the, 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 the Vedic uh, science of the bow. The, uh, which is the Veda of transformation. And when you pull back that bow and hold it perfectly still, not thinking, worrying, stressing out, you're not moving the arrow around, holding it perfectly still, and you release that arrow, you're acting from that place of total stillness, silence, and truth. And that's transformational because now you're, you've taken away the armor, the protective patterns of behavior, all the need for a screen, all these distractions, and you're allowing yourself to function at that deep level. If we don't dip the cloth in the dye of that science in nature on a regular basis, what they say now 120 minutes per week, we, we flip into right that, that busy mind world, that distracted world, that world of, of needing return on investment, that reward chemistry dopamine world, and we, we lose access to our inner space. And that inner space you know, is, they say, proportionally as void as intergalactic space, which is really interesting. But that space is really powerful, and we've traded it in for a screen. 
Uh, we've traded in for making money or being capitalistic. Nothing's wrong with that. It's just that we have to remember where we came from and dip the cloth in that dye. So, so let's talk about, well, talk to me a little bit, you know, in Japan, they, 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 um, they certified these, I think, 64 forests in Japan for yeah. therapeutic forests. And you go there and you get all these incredible benefits yeah. when you go into these forests. I want you to tell me what those benefits are. And also I want you to tell me, what do you do when you're in that forest? <laughs> you actually take a bath or yeah. what are we, what are we really talking about here? Sure. So uh, we're talking about forest bathing or Shinrin Yoku. And um, forest bathing has really become quite a phenomenon, you know, over the last few years. And um, the, my co-guide in, in the school, Mark Rule, is a, a forest bathing guide and uh, has taught me a lot about, about, lot about the practice. Um, when I first learned about it, you know, it kind of, uh, you know, I kind of reflected on the fact that, you know, I, I kind of grew up in the woods, you know. So for me, when I started hearing about forest bathing, I was like, sure, like, this makes sense. You know, this is... Um, recognizing that the forest is a healer. This is recognizing that the forest is our natural habitat. Um, we evolved um, in relationship with trees and in forests. So in Japan in the early 1980s, um, the, the Japanese Forest Agency actually piloted a um, uh, initiative which they called Shinrin Yoku. And uh, it was based on um, beliefs and cultural um, practices from Japan. Um, this idea that there are powerful places on the earth that have healing properties from Shinto, Shintoism, um, and that there is an energy called Kami, sort of the spirit of place. You know, we can gain benefits from being um, in these places on the earth and each place has a different quality. Um, so when forest bathing first kicked off, it was in response to the high levels of stress from folks living in really urban areas in Japan. And um, there was a, a belief that being in the forest would help people to come back to that stillness that you're referring to, come back to their essential nature. Um, a few years into the um, experiment, uh, they started to conduct research on the effects of the, the forest bath. And so it's, it's not literally bathing, like you're not like, you know, soaping up and taking a shower in the woods, but it's the idea of opening up all of your senses to the forest environment. And so generally in a forest bathing practice, um, the invitation is it's not athletic. There's nothing at all athletic about the practice. It's actually um, a very slow um, and mindful saunter or slow walk um, through a forest environment. And the idea is to begin to um, smell the air, feel the temperature of the, of the air on your skin, um, you know, perhaps even let your feet touch the earth. Maybe you take your shoes off and allow your feet to touch the earth. Um, not everybody feels comfortable with that, but that's certainly something that one can do. Um, to reach out and touch the bark of the trees and um, awaken your, your tactile sensations. Um, noticing the smells, um, there are essential oil compounds that are secreted by different evergreen trees, what are called phytoncide. Um, and these have been shown to, um, boost our immunity, um, to essentially induce a relaxed state. So lower cortisol levels, um, lower heart rate and blood pressure. Um, so just a 45 minute walk in the forest has been shown to have all of these really wonderful benefits. Um, and oftentimes um, that's been contrasted to, let's say, walking in an urban environment where it's mostly concrete um, around and man-made buildings and that, um, that effect is not found. Um, you know, what I find very interesting about the practice of forest bathing is some of the research that um, the Kaplans have done at the University of Michigan. And these are environmental psychologists. And they've looked um, at the effects that um, looking out of a window or being outdoors and looking at a green space has on our attention. And so they've developed a whole theory called attention restoration theory, um, where they've shown that um, just by looking out of a window um, onto a green space, um, essentially allows the brain to recover from what they call directed attention fatigue. And so this is what most of us have in our jobs, um, where we're kind of 
focusing on trying to focus, let's say working on a spreadsheet or something where we're having to inhibit lots of competing stimulate stimulation that's coming through. Maybe, you know, we're getting pings from emails, we're getting texts on our phone and it takes a lot of energy for the brain to inhibit those competing stimuli to focus on that spreadsheet. And um, that's called directed attention fatigue. And many of us experience that sense of, gosh, you know, my, I'm just not feeling productive anymore. I'm tired. I can't seem to hold my focus. Well, we, we weren't really designed to, to do that for prolonged periods of time. Um, when we were hunter gatherers, we would do that for a little while. Maybe we'd be like working on an arrowhead or we'd be shucking corn um, for a period of time. And then We'd get up and we'd look around and we'd watch the wind blowing through the trees. We'd see a cloud up in the sky. We'd hear bird song. We'd look around and we would allow our attention to just open up to take in the full field of what was happening. And that's very restorative, especially when we're in an open green space. Maybe we're just looking at the tall grass in the field blowing. And then we can come back to shucking the corn or carving or working on one of our like little projects. Um, but today, many people just don't have access to that restorative space that re relieves and helps the brain to recover. So forest bathing is, is a prescription for that. That's saying, hey, all right, I'm in my office job. I'm working on my computer for six hours today. And then the prescription for that is I'm going to go outside and I'm going to leave my phone you know, in my car um, and I'm going to take 15 minutes. And I'm just going to walk and I have no agenda. I have no destination. Um, I'm simply going to open myself up to receive and be in relationship to um, just whatever's unfolding in the present moment in this forest. Um, and it's amazing. It's, it's, it's a beautiful practice and, and different complementary practices can be woven into that. Um, like the sit spot, you know, where you might go and um, walk for 10 minutes and then just sit down and then kind of do what the Buddha did, you know, find a tree and sit and begin to focus on your breath. Um, but what I like to teach and what we offer in the School of Mindful Outdoor Leadership is, um, you know, rather than introverting, drawing awareness inside, we let our awareness remain extroverted. Um, and we simply begin to open up to anything that might be moving on the land. And after about 10 or 12 minutes, you know, what we'll notice is that all of that, um, the ripples that we sent out when we walked into the forest, you know, the disturbance that we created as a big human being walking into the woods, um, those ripples begin to uh, settle. And then the activity of the creatures who live in the forest might begin to pick back up again now that we've become very still and centered. And so it's in these sit spot practices that, um, you know, you might be gifted with, you know, red fox, you know, running, walking in front of you that you wouldn't have seen otherwise, or, um, you know, noticing an owl that lands, you know, in a tree. And like these kind of interspecies connections can also be incredibly uh, restorative for modern people. Like many of us uh, deal with what's called species loneliness, which is just being isolated from our relatives in the more than human world. Um, and so forest bathing and a lot of these practices can help to help us to reopen those lines of communication with creatures and plants um, and and I, I'll even open it up to, um, you know, the standing beings, the trees, the stone people, you know, all of the relationships that are on the land that, um, you know, in modern society, we've kind of, um, we've put a label on them. And then we think that we've, we know what that is. But um, I've always found through mindfulness practice that um, we can kind of let those labels slip away and then begin to open up to the mystery of what things are. So most people, you know, go in the woods, find a sit spot like yourself when they go and they find a place to kind of close their eyes and meditate like they would do in their, in their bedroom or something. <clears throat> You're saying that we should actually go into the woods and actually have, you know, an expanded awareness and allow that, that sensory input to be enhanced from the outside. Just describe for us exactly how you do that. Um, so it's, it's pretty simple. Um, and it's nice if you can have a, a spot that you go regularly. So, and it doesn't have to be in a, a deep wild place. It could be in a park near your house. Um, it could be in, um, you know, an abandoned lot, you know, where there are some trees growing and, you know, some, some things that have gone wild. Um, but the idea is to find a place that you feel comfortable in 
and to start making a little pilgrimage there regularly. So for me, I like to go sit in my backyard and I've got a mountain behind my house. And what, what you do is um, I always start with setting an intention. So I like to just begin, I'll step outside and I'll take a deep breath in and a long exhale just to kind of, you know, shift into that parasympathetic place of relaxation. Um, and then I'll do a little walking uh, meditation. So just letting each step be sort of my meditation practice. So just focusing on stepping, connecting with the earth. And then when I get to that place where I'm going to do that sit spot practice, um, sometimes there's a threshold between, you know, where we are and where we're going. Uh, and I really like to pay attention to these threshold places. Uh, sometimes they're called ecotones. So it could be, you know, the edge between the sidewalk and that abandoned lot. You know, it might be um, the boundary between an orchard and a forest. Um, where I guide a lot of times at Kripalu, we have an old orchard. You know, this orchard up on the hill where we have all these big apple trees. And then we have a, a really amazing forest. And there's this place where you're, in, you're right on the boundary between one and the other. And I like to pause at those places for a moment and um, just begin to listen and pay attention to the sounds around me. Um, noticing the sound of the wind, um, noticing the sound of the birds, and beginning to connect into um, what John Young and Tom Brown, who are some nature connection uh, teachers that I have learned from, call the baseline. What is the baseline of the land you're on? So the baseline is like that hum, that, act, that level of activity that is present when there's not a big disturbance on the land. So just noticing, okay, I can hear the birds. I can hear a chipmunk right now. Just noticing that. And then acknowledging that as I step over this threshold that I'm stepping with reverence. I'm stepping into this place with awareness. I'm paying attention. And I'm trying to minimize my zone of, my zone of disturbance. So I'm going to really walk with awareness here. I'm going to Maybe I'm going to go into social silence. Maybe I'm not, if I'm with someone, maybe we're going to not talk, but we're just going to kind of be together and notice. So I'll kind of walk in from that place. And as I'm walking, I'll just notice, like, I'll notice if a chipmunk or a blue jay starts sounding an alarm, you know, okay, they know that, you know, the more than human world knows I'm here, you know, and then I'll just walk and I'll just start to stay open for like, is there a place that feels nice or inviting? And if I f see a tree or a rock, I'll go and I'll sit there. And then the idea is to just kind of settle in and try to become as still as you can. So to just minimize as much movement as possible and then to begin to regulate the breath. So taking a deep breath in and a long, slow, deep breath out. Just beginning to work yourself into that state of just present moment awareness. And once I'm there, I'll begin to open my awareness up to movement. And so now I'm kind of going more to vision and I begin to like open up to my peripheral vision and just kind of take in anything that's moving. And what's really cool about this practice is um, you'll begin to notice very, very subtle movements like individual blades of grass that are just very gently moving in the breeze you know? or maybe way off to the upper right, you'll catch like just the flicker of a tail feather of a bird you just never would have noticed was there and just sit with that awareness for you know 15 minutes is great as a minimum if one can do it um, up to half an hour or 45 minutes um, in the school of mindful outdoor leadership we start each day with this practice so students who are training to be mindful outdoor guides will um, we'll gather by a fire in the morning before the sun comes up and we'll just gaze at a fire for about 15 minutes or so just drop into that kind of state of mindful awareness. Then we'll do some little warm ups, and then each student will go off to their nature meditation spot for about 45 minutes and they'll just sit as the sun's coming up and do this practice for 45 minutes at the start of each day. Um, and it's a, it's a profound invitation to deepening intimacy with the land. And uh, it, it's a, it's a life practice. It's, you know, for me, it's been similar to like learning, the three part breath in yoga, you know, it's, it's, it seems simple. Um, and it is simple. Um, but the more you work it and the more you bring it into your life, like the deeper and more profound it becomes. I used to, um, and I still do. You know, we spend a lot of time in nature. And also what's really interesting is that the parks in America are 
way more visited than they've ever been. So there's something good happening yeah. there. I don't know if it's enough, but uh, I think people are getting the message somehow that they need to get out there. And I, I love the Ayurvedic concept that, that, um, that, the, that the coexistence of opposites exists in everything. You know, we have a, a, you know, a hurricane with crazy winds with a silent center, a solar system with a silent sun in the middle, with spinning planets, you know, nuclei of atoms with spinning electrons. Everything is a combination of dynamic activity and silence at the same time. And one of the things I used to do is go, still do is when I go into nature is exactly that thing. But I always like when I'm, when you're doing that expansive look, it just reminded me of like, I'll look for that, that dynamic activity and the silence at the same time. Like you said, a, a blade of grass moving. And then you, you look into that, you look and you see, wow, everything seems so still, but there's this dynamic activity is moving. And inside that blade of grass, it's pumping fluids and water. Right. It's like crazy, right? The microcosm yeah. part. Right. You know, if you look at a river, it's totally still and quiet, but it's rapidly moving, you know? And I just love that concept that in within this silence, there is, you know, dynamic activity. And if you're doing it right, within your dynamic activity is silence. And if you can do both of those, you can be dynamically active and also, you know, actively calm you that's one of the ways i think we link up in that relationship is what is is what you're saying because the earth is completely still but incredibly dynamically active yeah. we are mostly dynamically active we don't know how to get still anymore and if we allow that to happen all of a sudden we've created that harmony that can allow relationship and communication does that make sense oh totally yeah I, you know i i couldn't agree more um you know, one of the things that's really um, so rewarding for me to observe and, and students that I get to work with um, is the way that that, um, that experience that they're having when they're just inviting that sense of, you know, what we may call the witness, you know, in yoga, you know, the observer, um, the profound effect that that has on their ability to um, open themselves up to and, and, let their awareness begin to um, receive the gifts and the teachings that the earth has in store. Um, you know, Aaron, who is the Dean for the school of Ayurveda here at Kripalu, like comes into the school. And um, you know, one of the things that she shares with the students is a lot about um, circadian rhythms, you know, and beginning to bring our sort of daily patterns into harmony with the season, uh, the Ayurvedic clock you know, and um, beginning to let people have access to that dynamic stillness and action that's really, really present in daily routines. Um, and it's, you know, it's really amazing to see people like the lights go off as they begin to feel just the, the peace and the stillness and the, the comfort that comes with um, just beginning to stop swimming against the current in their own daily routine and habits. Right. Um, and a lot of that, you know, John, one of the reasons why I wrote the book and got into this work was because, um, you know, it just, it seemed to me that, you know, Ayurveda and yoga, um, these are, these are profound wisdom traditions that came from folks spending time in deep relationship to the earth, you know, and it's interesting because in our time today, um, it seems like the yoga and the mindfulness communities have become as nature disconnected in some ways as the rest of our society, just in the sense that, you know, so many of the classes and retreats and experiences that folks have with these traditions are happening inside, you know, and we're doing asanas like these yoga postures, you know, tree and, you know, um, cobra and all these different poses, you know, that are really we're inspired by animals and the contours of the living earth. Um, but we've kind of adopted them in these environments where we're, we're no longer being nourished by these forces. You mentioned and, in your, you mentioned yeah. in your book, uh, that, that, uh, epiphany you had when you were doing <laughs> yoga, like the 10th floor of some New York city yeah. building and on a plastic mat and a, you know, completely no window open room and, 
in, in a major city and you just realize just how disconnected this really is. And that brings me to the, the understanding in Ayurveda. I've written a lot about it. My people will understand this concept because they, we, I talk a lot about ojas, which is that, that very subtle substance in our body um, that it re is regards, that's related to vitality and vigor and, and, and radiance. And it's uh, something that Ayurveda talks a lot about. And one of the best ways to get it, there's many ways, but one of the ways is to go into nature. And that's one of the best ways to build your ojas up. And so, so I'm, I'm curious if you can, you know, comment on that. Um, you know, if you have any insight into how is it that nature can build ojas in the body, which, you know, ojas is the, is the physical expression of consciousness. It's the most refined aspect of digestion. It takes 30 days for our body to make it. And if it's not, if you're stressed out, you don't make it basically. Um, and it's this substance that supports our immune function and our, 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 and that deep, deep conscious connection. But we get that ojas in nature. So I'd love to hear what you know about that. Yeah. Um, well, you know, when I was a kid, I can remember um, my, my dad had a cabin up in Maine and um, it was kind of a, it's a cool place. It's, a, it's kind of like a pyramid shaped cabin. It was off the grid and uh, you know, no running water, no electricity, um, had an outhouse, you know, <laughs> we dig very rustic, you know, and I can remember going um, when I was a young man and, and in particular, I can remember going when I was about 15, we did two weeks up there. And I remember the first two or three days when the sun would set, I'd start to get this lonely feeling. And um, it was kind of like um, there, was, there wasn't that stimulation that I was used to, you know, no TV, no, nothing to distract. Um, but about two or three days into it, I started to feel stronger and more alive. Um, you know, we, we would bring our, our bow and arrows up there and I would, you know, we'd shoot archery at hay bales and go swimming in a, in a spring fed stream and the smell of the white pines and just the dragonflies overhead. It's evening. And, um, it was interesting after about a week or two, I started to feel like more vibrant and stronger and more like assured of who I was. And I can remember coming home and I was 15. So it was probably the most insecure I ever felt, you know, just the awkwardness of adolescence, but I can remember coming home and just feeling the best I'd ever felt during my adolescent years. And I guess I just share that story because I, for me, like that is part of the answer to, to your question. Um, you know, you said that, you know, OGIS is built when, you know, our immune system is functioning well, when, when we're not in a fight or flight or a stress state. Um, what I've learned over you know, the years and through my research and, and my writing is that um, we are an animal species and, and we have a habitat that we're adapted for. We evolved in relationship to certain habitats. And I think if you take an animal out of their natural habitat and put it in captivity, they tend to struggle. And I think that when you, um, you know, George Monboy wrote a book called uh, Feral, which is all about rewilding. And um, he kind of comes at it from the perspective of rewilding of ecosystems, which is reintroducing megafauna, like elephants and lions and, and letting them bring a, a natural order back into our ecosystems. Um, the human side of that is reintroducing the modern sort of domesticated human into their wild um, habitat. And so that human beings become kind of feral. So we're a domesticated version of ourselves, but we begin to redevelop these wild traits. Um, and I think that, you know, whether it's, you know, your 120 minutes of, of getting outside a week or whether it's a camping trip and, and there's some great research now that I'm sure you've, you've seen about how camping can reset our circadian rhythms. Right. right? And how forest that was done right here in Boulder. Yeah. Right. And how forest bathing, um, you know, can help us, um, reduce anxiety and stress and, and boost our immunity. Like these are all, I think just little indications of how important it is for us to, um, in our own unique ways as individuals, find a way to rewild our lives that works for us. It doesn't have to be some super hardcore, you know, I'm going to go on survivor show or something. Um, you know, it, it can be as simple as forest bathing. It can be as simple as gardening. You know, it can be as simple as maybe taking our meditation practice outside. Um, 
But I think these are ways that we do boost our OGIS, you know, and, and, and a play, one other thing for me that I wrote about in the book that I, I'm passionate about is foraging. So, um, and, and, you know, what wild foods are in season growing around you? And is there a way that we can begin to get back in touch with those foraging skills, those harvesting skills that, um, you know, our ancestors knew? And, you know, for me, like my Italian ancestors, I have a little bit of a connection to them. And, um, you know, they were mushroom hunters. Like, and I know seasonally they would forage mushrooms. And um, there were all kinds of um, food practices that my ancestors on the Italian side had that um, I'm beginning to um, – kind of become reacquainted with. And I think that's a kind of an interesting inquiry, you know, for no matter who your ancestors are, we all have a connection to wild foods and to the OGIS that we can build through getting back in touch with where our food comes from. Yeah, I mean, it's such a great point, you know, and, you know, studies have shown that the air that we breathe in the forest has completely different microbes than the air that we breathe in the in the cities the air we breathe in the winter in the forest is different than the air we breathe in the summer in the forest the when you forage you're talking about eating seasonal roots or seasonal plants or leaves or whatever and the microbes in the soil have been shown to dramatic change from one season to the next right so when you eat those foods you know how do we reconnect with those rhythms well who's in charge of those rhythms are the microbes that are in the air that we breathe that are in that are on the foods that we eat and if we change and i've written of course a lot about seasonal eating and and uh how important that is but what you're talking about is like you know this whole immersion bringing your body into this into this forest opening up your senses to feeling it but then in you know then you know foraging and eating the foods from the soil right there that have the microbes for that season at that particular time of the year which is so critically important to inoculate our gut with those right bugs in the right season at the right time, which is really important. Breathing that air, all those things that you say, I think is really what is what's building that OGIS. OGIS is that connection of our consciousness with that silence or that consciousness in nature. And it's like a recharge, right? Mm -hmm. Sort of like a, a recharge. You mentioned a, a story that I, I was really, I loved reading about in your book. It was the story of Ram, uh, and Lakshman from the Mahabharata on the lake. Mm -hmm. uh, would you mind sharing that story? I thought it was pretty, pretty oh. important. Oh, sure. Um, yeah, I love, I love that story. The first time I read it, um, it really landed for me and I thought it was um, very sweet and it, it kind of speaks to how um, different presences on the land can really be our teachers and in this instance, a lake. Um, so, um, you know, uh, Rama and Lakshmana have been exiled. And um, so they're, they're exiles and they've been, they're in the forest. And, um, and it's, it was, it's a hard scenario for um, Lakshmana to accept. Um, so this is a, hang on a sec. This yeah. is a king and a prince. So, you know, they're brothers. Yes. One's a king, one's a prince. And they've been exiled into the forest. Okay, go on. Okay, yes. They've been exiled into the forest. And, you know, Rama is the incarnation of Vishnu. So he's like the wisest, strongest, um, you know, you know he's, he's God essentially in human form. And his brother um, is, is really struggling with their situation and complaining and um, dwelling on it, you know, as they're walking through the jungle on their way to a lake. Um, you know, and they, they come to this lake and, um, you know, they take their, their bows and they put their bows in the, in the mud and, um, Rama goes out into the water and it's this, you know, jewel of a lake, you know, in this beautiful forest and Rama swims out, you know, into the middle of this lake. And, um, you know, he's basically advising his brother to, um, you know, to let it go. Like, you know, that things will have a way of working themselves out. And, um, his brother asks him, um, you know, how, how do you know, like when, how do you know when to, you know, take bold action and fight and when to surrender essentially? But, but also let me interrupt because I, yeah. the part, the, 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 he was intensely, you know, anxious because Ram's wife had been kidnapped basically. Yes. So he wanted to go, you know, catch her and here's Ram swimming in a lake. Like, what's up? We should be like not taking time to relax. So then he says, what? <laughs> So then he says, you know, when, when your mind is as calm and as still and as serene as this lake, you know, then you'll know, you know, then you'll know. And, um, you know, for me being kind of a Gen Xer, um, 
the first thing I thought of was, you know, Empire Strikes Back and the return of the, uh, you know, the teachings of Yoda, because that's mm -hmm. exactly pretty much what Yoda said to Luke Skywalker in that Star Wars film. And, um, you know, it was just this idea that, um, you know, we want to, um, you know, if we want to live with, with skill and wisdom, you know, then we want to kind of, um, we need to know how to regulate ourselves so that when we're deeply disturbed, when we're angry, when we're fearful, when we're anxious, you know, that we can do those practices that will help us to, um, you know, essentially be the witness, be the observer, and, and really think, you know, with wisdom and feel, um, you know, you know what, what is the way of nature here? Um, and, and to kind of access that deeper knowing, which uh, Rama was sort of, you know, using the lake as an example of how to access that. And um, just if I could just share another quick story, John, kind of along let, those lines. Let, yeah. let, me, let, let, me, let me comment on that story real quick, because I want to sure. make the point to our listeners that, you know, the lake represents that inner silence, that inner space that we all have, but many of us, that inner space isn't calm, or we're going 90 miles an hour thinking about this and this on screens, go, go, go. So the idea was to, for him to immerse himself into that inner space, into that inner silence. And then from that space, we take action. So here he's got to go fight the war to get his wife back and do all these things. And he's like taking a swim, which looks like a swim, or going into the woods and taking a native forest bathing. It looks like a wasting time. I got work to do. I got money to make. I got bills to pay. But by actually establishing that being, that calm, we then perform better action. And that's that old saying that we, that we, uh, we do less and, and accomplish more. Uh, we, the more we create that silence, the bigger the I, the more powerful the winds of the storm. And this is what my, my first book, Body Mind Sport, is all about the runner's high. If you can create brainwave coherence and alpha, calm brains, meditative waves during vigorous activity, you find my best race is my easiest race. So the point of that story I thought was just so beautiful that you brought it in there was like, we've lost access to inner space. We've lost access to that calm. And even if you have something really urgent to do, you have to realize that you got to pull back the bow. And when you pull back the bow, even though you're like nervous because you got to, you know, go rescue your wife, you've got to find a way to find yourself to separate all the craziness, access that calm, and then shoot that arrow from that place of calm. And that's what this whole thing of yoga breathing and meditation is all about. And it's what the forest does for us. It helps to give us that ability to, to reset that. Okay, now tell your other story. <laughs> no, I love that. Thank you so much for, um, for, for really condensing and clarifying that. Um, it, it, it's so powerful. And, um, you know, I, what I, you know, the nature and being out on the land can, can um, help us get there more easily. And I often hear from students that they find meditation easier right. when they're outside. And, and, you know, a lot of times, a lot of people struggle because they try to bring their awareness inside. They try to have no thoughts. And, you know, what I will encourage folks to do is, you know, when we, when we go outside, we'll sit down, I'll say, okay, now just like let your awareness open up and don't try to control your thoughts, just pay attention to what's moving around you. And for many, many people, they're fully present, but they're stimulated by the movement on the land. And so they find it easier to kind of drop into that deep quiet because they're not trying to control as much. Um, and, and the story I wanted to relay is just, um, you know, I had, a, I had a woman in one of my trainings. We did this sit spot practice where they go out on the land and just sit and observe for 15 minutes. It's really profound. You know, we, she came back and what I usually do after we do these sit spot practices, we, you know, we have counsel practice where we'll just go one at a time. We'll pass a stick around. Each person speaks and everyone else just really listens and gives them their full attention. And she shared that um, while she was sitting, you know, she was staring at a tree. It was a big oak tree that had died, um, but it was still, um, it was rotten inside. And there maybe were a couple live branches, but it was, it was like a kind of a big old dying dead oak tree, just barely alive, you know, and she spent the 15 minutes with the tree. And as she was just sitting there, the, you know, in her awareness, the tree became a symbol for her father. And all of a sudden it just elicited like all of these feelings that she'd had about her dad and how her dad had, um, even though he had lived on, you know, there was a lot of ways that he had stopped living prior. And, you know, just by having, you know, who would have thought, you know, that just by sitting out there, 
you know, being with this tree that it would have given her an opportunity to begin to process some of her grief around her father and then coming back into this circle um, and having the chance to share her experience without anyone giving her advice or trying to fix it. Um, you know, she just shared with me like it was, you know, it was a very healing experience. And I think that there, um, and certainly this is a big theme in, in, in eco psychology, um, you know, there are so many ways that um, by inviting mindfulness outdoors, that we allow ourselves to be taught and to be guided um, by teachers and presences and, um, you know, beings who are very much present on the land that modern people really just have lost access to, kind of in the same way we've lost access to our elders, um, you know, that we gain access to. And, and I really think that mindfulness is such a powerful doorway to help people get there because you, it, you don't always catch it if you're going on a guided hike or you're with your friends and you're kind of being social or you're exercising. And not that those things aren't great. They're awesome. I love to see people out there like getting out in the woods, but um, unless there's an intention to practice mindfulness and to invite that stillness that you're talking about, John, um, we, we do miss a lot of some of the benefits that are out there for us. And so that's one of the things I really tried to land in the book is that, um, you know, there is an intentionality, there is a practice to this, which links to yoga, links to meditation, it links to Ayurveda, um, that if we bring it in, um, there's so much that we can benefit from. And also, I think, important, very importantly, it's not just a one-way street, there's a reciprocity. You know, we, there's also something we can give back to the earth through uh, an enhanced and more aware relationship that we have with our lands. Um, and I know that we probably got to wrap it up soon, but you know, Richard Louv in his book, Last Child in the Woods, coined that term nature deficit disorder um, to talk about our society today. And one of the things that he talks about is um, place blindness, which is that because of the amount of time we're spending on screens, uh, many people just are not, uh, they don't know their lands. They don't know what, animals are near them, what plants are near them. They may not know what conservation lands are near them or what opportunities there are for conservation. Um, my hope is that through mindful rewilding and what we're doing in the School of Mindful Outdoor Leadership, we can help people to see um, and overcome place blindness and begin to feel like they are stewards, um, kind of awaken to this calling that I think is really present today that, um, you know, we, we're called, I think, to um, to begin to really steward the lands around us locally. Um, I think many people can feel very overwhelmed by some of the, um, the big environmental challenges that are facing us. But if we can begin to bring our mindful practices and our intimacy with the land to our local places, um, we can really become local stewards um, of the places that we love. And, and that really is my hope um, you know, for the book. And, and I think in the, in the yoga and the Ayurveda and the mindfulness communities, People love nature and I think um, are hungry and looking for ways to um, make a connection between their Ayurveda study and their connection to the lands. And so, um, you know, I, I hope that the writing in the book really sort of inspires and empowers people to um, begin to explore these possibilities. Yeah, and I think it does. I think the book Rewilding is just, uh, you know, really a great book. It's more than just a, a, a mindfulness guide. It, uh, it's the whole package from how to start fires, from how to, you know, he, my guy takes you deeply, deeply into many levels of really reconnecting with nature, reconnecting with those rhythms, and really establishing that, that, that connection to that inner space. And then, which we so desperately need and have lost in our culture more now than ever before. So Micah, thanks again for writing this book. Thanks for joining us in today's podcast and uh, best of luck with the book. And it's a, it's a message and I hope to help, uh, you know, spread the word the best I can because it's an important message. You've got to get in those woods. Thank you so much, John. I, I'm, I'm deeply grateful for your support and to have a chance to talk with you about it. I always love talking with you and um, I'm, I'm just really, really grateful. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. Do you like this video? Don't forget to subscribe and share.
This recording is brought to you by LifeSpa, where ancient Ayurvedic wisdom meets modern science. Get access to free health video newsletters by Dr. John at LifeSpa.com. These statements have not been evaluated by the FDA. These products are not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease.